Tyler Griffin is the current York County GOP chairman, and he's also the third vice chair for the South Carolina GOP party, which in his role helps recruit a lot of young Republicans. I talk one-on-one -on -one with Tyler for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Tyler Griffin, welcome to the award-winning Quentin's Close-Ups. Uh, thank you so I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I, I, and congratulations for you on your 2000th interview, interview the other day. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. And thanks be to God and Jesus as always. I, I know that obviously you are the York County Republican Party chair, and you also are currently the third vice chair for the South Carolina GOP. And on your Facebook bio, it says this, you are also a full-time writer and a comic book enthusiast. And yes. you dabble, obviously, in history and politics. Let me ask you this. What are you writing today about history, and what are you writing about politics? Uh, well, I don't... Uh... In terms of the political, you know, that's what I what I do here um, with running the county party, um, and um, I haven't done as much history and political writing as I would have liked. Um, although soon I will no longer be chairman of the county party, so that can allow me some more freedom in expressing my views on things. So I might get to do some writing um, on that regard. I actually do uh, fiction writing is what I focus on the most, uh, as something completely separate from, from politics, a way to kind of not think about it sometimes. Um, I also do a lot of reading. I, um, I, w I was debating whether to do a Zoom call in my office upstairs, which is comic book themed, or to do it down here in our library, which I thought this was a bit more, I don't know, dignified. So I, I enjoy reading and, and learning about history. And, um, you know, in the past couple of years, we've been, you know, trying to grapple with in our country, you know, how do, how do we talk about certain issues and, and what figures, how should we approach certain figures? So I've been trying to, you know, do a lot of reading and, and learn from different perspectives. So. That's what I've been focusing on a lot in terms of history lately. And what are you reading in, in terms of politics these days? Uh, well, in political, um, so I, I've stopped really watching too much cable. I've stopped. I haven't watched cable news in years, but I've been. I haven't really reading too much news per se. Um, I, I do read National Review, which is good. Um, I'm subscribed to National Review. I uh, follow the a website called the Dispatch, which is. Uh, was started by people that used to be on National Review, uh, which is good. I also listen to a lot of podcasts, uh, do a lot of driving. So I, I find that good. It's, I don't know, I, I'm, you know, with the cable news, it's just, I feel like you don't learn a whole lot with cable news and it's just uh, kind of designed to make whoever's watching it happy. You know, it kind of gets your blood going. Um, I don't typically watch it, but I, um, I popped in and put Tucker Carlson on one night and oh my gosh, he got my blood going. Like he's just like with all the graphics and all that. So I was just like, yeah, I don't want to watch that stuff. <laughs> Um, so I just do mainly reading or listening to podcasts, get my political information. What are you learning about political information without cable news? Uh, well, I'm, I'm learning that it's a lot more complicated than I think the cable news likes to present it to be. Um, I think we've got, you know, with, with all the different uh, new, you know, whether it's Fox News and Newsmax is coming up or um, CNN and MSNBC, I feel like people tend to go and watch whichever one that is going to be more for their side and it's you know I, I don't like to use the term fake news really because i think it's kind of gets a little um dangerous using that term uh but people just like to go to whatever side makes them happy and makes them hear what they want to hear um and we get a lot of confirmation bias um and we see the same thing with social media uh right if you've got i don't know 600 friends on social media and 500 of those 600 people agree with you all you're going to see are the things that you agree with it's all confirmation bias um, so I've tried to look at multiple different sources and, you know, by listening to podcasts, you get, they kind of go more in depth with it. Or if you're actually reading an article, it tends to be a lot more complicated than the, you know, the, the two or three minute uh, group of six people screaming at each other, you know. And when you remove the confirmation bias and obviously cable news, what exactly are you learning right now about politics and what do you want to learn? Uh, well, I, it, it's hard. I, I want to get into more it's hard to learn the specifics, you know, with, with cable news and all that. So I try to, you know, read in depth about an issue. So we hear a lot of things about like the Georgia law or the um, HR one um, infrastructure bill and um, the stuff going on in the South Carolina Senate. There's so much going on and you kind of have to remove yourself and find information out for yourself um, because there are certain people that think that the, you know, on one side you hear that the stuff in Georgia is like the, the worst thing to ever happen. 
Um, on the other side, it's a you know election re reasonable election reform. And so, how do we find the middle? What parts of you know one side are legitimate? Uh, what's part of the other side are legitimate? Where is the exaggerations? And so, as you know, as being civically engaged, you need to kind of look at the source yourself. Uh, so that's been what I'm trying to get into. And it's it's hard, there's so much going on. You, know, you get into one topic, then something else happens, and it's it's really difficult to keep up with everything. Obviously, you are the current York County GOP, and obviously you're the third vice chair for South Carolina GOP. Where are the exaggerations when it comes to the Georgia law, and where are the exaggerations when it comes to House Resolution One? Um, well, I I need to you know that those are ones I need to look more into. Um, you know, I was providing those more or less as examples, um, but like uh, like for example. Um, I've seen, I, I, I'm on Twitter and I, you know, as, as a political person, you just have to be on Twitter. I don't tweet because I, I think Twitter is a mess, but I just get to get information from time to time and see what people are saying. And a lot of people, there's a part of the law that says, uh, or people have interpreted the Georgia law saying that you cannot give water to people standing in line. Um, from looking more into it and listening to information about it, what the law actually says, excuse me, is that you cannot, like a campaign person cannot give you water standing in line past a certain point because it is considered that, you know, if I've got a, I don't know, a Ralph Norman shirt on and I give you a bottle of water standing in line, maybe that would look like you're trying to, you know, make a perception of, of the, of the campaign. Um, it's not saying that nobody can give you water in line. Um, so that's a part of the law that like, for example, has been exaggerated. Um, so I haven't looked, I need to look more into it, but I think that's one, one kind of tiny example of like the larger story of like, if we, you know, go just solely based on what social media says, if we're going based on like a Facebook meme or a Twitter post, and that's the, you know, what we get of the information of what of our perception of what HR one is or of what the Georgia law is, then we're not really getting an accurate picture of what the law actually is. And what picture do you want to see? Where is the common ground? No, yeah. And I want to, I want to see the full picture because, and, and, and I, I mean, I want to talk when I'm, you know, I'm a, you know, Republican person. Um, but I want to see more than just what makes, um, you know, my, my camp happy. I want to look at the whole picture. I want to be able to see, you know, where are Democrats coming from? Because I think we're in a, a day and age where it's so hard to talk about, uh, you know, politics a little bit because we're, we're so far apart. Um, you know, I, I want to be able to see where is somebody coming from and what are the legitimate points of it? And then where can I acknowledge, you know, the, the old Reagan, um, saying used to be was that if I'm not going to agree with you on 100 percent of things, but there's going to be that 20 percent. So rather than going for the whole 100 percent, if I can get 80 percent, or where where can we find the common ground? Um, and so that's what I'm trying to uh, look into, and that's that's not very popular today. But where are Republicans coming from in your mind? Well, I think there are concerns about election integrity, and I I don't uh, election integrity for me isn't my be all and all issue. Um, but you know, after, after 2020, um, there were some Republicans that are concerned about election integrity. If we look at 2018, if we get like, let's look at Georgia, for example, 2018, we had, um, Stacey Abrams, who I don't believe she ever officially conceded because she talked about, you know, election, uh, issues as well. So in 2018, we have one candidate saying that they, you know, would not concede because of problems with the elections. In 2020, we have, controversies where the Republicans are talking about election problems. So we have both parties that are, seem to feel like the elections are not set up properly. So if we can agree that both sides have problems with it, it kind of made sense for Georgia to have some reform. Because if we have both parties that are upset about it, we need to find some um, some solution to this. So, um, you know, I, I think it gets it gets tricky when when election rules get politicized because that makes it so you know, if we have one part that's just like writing all the rules and that looks kind of, right, kind of looks iffy, right? You don't, you don't want that to happen. So I think election integrity is like an issue that we need both parties to, to be at the table for. And what reform would you bring to the table? Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, with the, with the pandemic, we had a lot of um, more, more relaxed rules for absentee voting. And I, I think we want to get people voting uh, but we also need to just make sure that the way that they're, um, you know, being sent out is proper. Um, the way um, I think in person absentee voting is great. So I think expanding that um, would be preferable. Um, we, I mean, we do a great job in South Carolina. Um, I've gone to work with the York County um, 
election board quite a lot and they're professional people. Um, so we, we don't, we don't really have that. Many, to me, we don't have that many problems in South Carolina. Um, and I know they are working on a couple of things in the Senate um, and probably tweaking a thing or two that I need to look more into. Um, but as, as far as South Carolina, I think we're, we're doing all right here. Um, but you know, people need to have confidence in the, in the voting system. So do you have voting, but do you have confidence in the voting system? I do. Yes. And what are those things as far as election reform, do you want the Senate to tweak right now? Uh, well, I, I think it's just, you know, going back to those pandemic rules, just making sure that those things aren't permanent for it. You know, it made sense why we did it with the pandemic, um, expanding certain things. Um, so I think if we can, as we're reflecting on 2020 and how that went, you know, are there things that we can, we can keep? How can we look at the kind of requirements for absentee voting? What are those requirements? Um, and um, for me, I'd, um, there, there are people that are much more passionate about um, election reform uh, than me. Um, you know, being from South Carolina, being from York County, where I feel very confident about the election system, it's not one thing that gets my, my blood boiling, really. But so. what gets your bowl blood, blood, blood <laughs> boiling, Alice? My stuff, because the stuff gets, that gets my blood boiling is the boring stuff. The, one, the stuff that doesn't get people. Uh, that's important, but it's not that exciting to talk about, you know, the, the debt um, in our country. You know, we Republicans, we love to talk about the debt when, when we're not in office, but then we get in office, we don't really talk about it anymore. Um, so the, the spending, uh, I'd be interested in getting that under control. Um, you know, just uh, pro, you know, smart, smart economical ideas. Um, um, I need to, this is another topic I want to look more into, but I've always been favorable toward, let's say, like medicinal marijuana. I, I know that's going through um, the Senate. And, I, and, and for me, like as a younger, younger person, I think that's like a common sense thing. You know, if it helps people, um, then, you know, let people use it if it's going to help. A lot of people say like, oh, they're, they're kind of stuck in this mindset that somehow medicinal marijuana is going to lead to everyone smoking pot. And uh, uh, Senator Tom Davis uh, is, a, is a great leader on that issue. So that, that's something that I care about. Um, so. That's, that's just a couple of issues, especially the debt. That's just kind of bores people. They don't want to hear about numbers, but that, that's important. Where are the numbers when it comes to smart economic ideas? Well, I, I, you know, I, I think if we can, we want to incentivize companies to come to South Carolina, which we have been doing, um, you know, the past uh, couple of Republican administrations, we have seen um, more businesses coming to the state. Um, so I think if we can... Um, incentivize um, companies to come here, you know, with, with our tax policies, but also we need to reinvest in our state. You know, we, one, one thing we always talk about, and, and this has been a common theme since I got involved in politics is like the roads. So how do we make sure that if people are going to come to our state that, you know, say our infrastructure um, is, is under control and um, adapting to that in, in uh, York County, um, where we're one of the fastest growing places, not just in the state, but like nationwide. And so we're constantly having to like revamp our roads and have new bridges. And how can we balance our growth with our infrastructure? You know, do we want to build like 200 new homes if it means that we don't have the roads to handle it? So that, that's definitely a local issue that I care a whole lot about. How do you balance that with smart growth? I, I, it's difficult for sure because you want to, you know, when you, when you, you want to attract new people for sure. Um, but you, you bring in that new tax base, you, you, you know, you expand and all that. But at the same time, there, there are things that, um, with, with smart growth. And I actually, I teach, um, I teach geography in school. I'm a high school teacher. So we talk about smart growth all the time. Um, you know, that, that idea of having places and walking distance or, um, having public transportation or making sure that when you're tearing all this stuff down, you're not getting rid of all the green space, um, and at the end of the day with smart growth, I think it comes down to like, people want to live in places like that. Like it, it, it feels nice. It, um, you want people to grow up in places where they don't just see buildings and, and roads. You want to see, you know, parks and, um, and things like that. So, um, I don't think I have the exact answer for how we exactly balance it, but I think it's like, when you think about what people actually want, I think it, I don't think most people would disagree with smart growth with, with the concept of it. And obviously you talk about obviously your county being one of the most fastest growing co counties yeah. in the country. What is the tax base there? Uh, well, we've got a lot of people from Charlotte. Um, a lot of people that work in Charlotte and then live in Fort Mill. Um, I actually, I'm kind of a, a, an example of, you know, someone that I was not born in South Carolina. I wasn't born super far. I was born in North Carolina uh, in Charlotte. And then um, my family moved, you know, 10 minutes down South 
to be in Fort Mill because uh, my sister was going to go to a school in Charlotte that my parents didn't want to go to. So we went to Fort Mill and Fort Mill was very well known for our schools, you know, other, um, a lot of other places in the state, you know, aren't, uh, you know, they're school. We, we were Fort Mill. We're kind of almost an exception to the rule, rule when, you know, South Carolina is known as being like bottom tier nationwide schools, which is something that I hope we can change in the future. Um, and so schools attract people, um, we had that small town vibe, although that's kind of changing in Fort Mill over time and Rock Hill. Oh, yes. um, but yeah, that, that's, you know, Charlotte, Charlotte people, we've all, we've got people that have been living in the county for a while too. So it's kind of a, a balance between the two. Um, I saw someone with a, uh, with a bumper sticker that had like Ohio, but it was in between like a South Carolina, like the shape of South Carolina. So okay. it's kind of funny. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. Well, uh, let me turn back to York County. Obviously, like I indicated, you are the York County Republican Party. And you'll be stepping down uh, very soon. But let me ask you this. During your particular time, how many members did you actually recruit for the party? Uh, for the for the party? York, York County, yes, sir. Uh, so we had our uh, reorg uh, this past month. So that's when we, uh, or in March, that's when we knew try to we kind of turn the party off and turn it back on, trying to get people recruited and all that. Uh, we had about 340 people that we recruited with our with our reorg process, which is a record breaking number. So I was very excited for that. You know, it's a, a good way to be stepping down with a with a number like that. Um, and people people are just excited right now. So we want to capture that excitement and make sure that they're putting. You know, if they if people are angry, we want them to be putting their anger into something productive rather than you know any alternative outlet. And what is that alternative outlet that you see? Uh, well, I just see people that kind of like some people are fuming, you know, they just, you know, either spend the time posting on social media, or just being mad. And I say, you know, if you're mad, you know, that's fine, but get involved. And this is, I would say this to Republicans and Democrats. If you're mad, don't just sit there and be mad and sulk, you know, get involved in either a local party or a, if there's a specific issue that you care about, get involved in that and, and work toward it, um, you know, organize. And so we've been asking people to just, if you're upset, we get it, but, you know, come here. We'll, we'll find an outlet for you. How do you reorganize for the next five years? Uh, well, that that is, as a party, we, we, we kind of have to have, like, um, you know, that, that far side division and the, the near side division um, because we've got our next election coming up in 2022. You know, we're always, um, always busy, always getting ready for the next election, but then we've got 2024 after that, which is the presidential one. People are usually more excited for that one. Um, but in the back one, we also need to be recruiting candidates or recruiting people for the long term because we've got state reps and state senators who, you know, were great. We love them, but maybe two, four, six. And I'm not, I don't, I'm not saying this because I have an insight. I just, you know, just guessing, you know, we're not going to have the same people forever. So we want to be training people in the background too to start, you know, being ready to run for office one day. We've had actually our past two uh, chairman of, the, of the York County GOP are now um, elected officials. We are. Uh, the chairman before me, Joel Hamilton, he's now a county councilman. Um, Wes Clymer is now a state senator. Um, I have no plans to do that. Uh, but, you know, that's just kind of an example of how we want to recruit people to get them involved, get them involved in the community, and then down the road, they could run for office. What is your insight on 2022? Uh, for, well, 2022, you know, I know, like, nationally, we want to take back the House and um, uh, take back at least, if we can take back at least one Senate seat, that'd be great. So we can um, get the Senate back. Other uh, the Senate map in twenty twenty two is looking uh, fairly difficult. It looks like we're defending more seats, and we are really, um, you know, going to be on offensive for um, South Carolina wise. You know, uh, we've got the governor's race, right. um, which I'm sure there'll be a Republican primary for, and then uh, you know we'll have all the the U.S. House seats up. We we'll have all the um, the state House seats, so that'll be exciting. Now, let me go back to Yorktown. Where in Yorktown exactly did you gain membership over the past year? Uh, a lot, lot of places in a lot of Rock Hill, um, Fort Mill and TAK has probably been our biggest areas over the past couple of years. Um, we still have you know, solid memberships in New York, which is kind of the more rural part of the county. Right. Um, but Rock Hill, uh, Fort Mill, uh, TAK, uh, the Lake Wiley area, those are kind of like the big booming areas of the county. So that's where we're seeing a lot of our memberships. Now, how many members did you actually lose over the past year? We haven't, I mean, we, we've lost some folks for sure. Um, but we've, um, and, and some of those have been, you know, people just step aside and, and we haven't, uh, a lot of our membership is relatively older. I bring down our average age um, a little bit. Uh, but, uh, 
you know, some people just have, you know, tried to go into re retirement. Um, so I, I can't think of the exact number, but for the same amount of people that we, we lose, we, we've kind of gained back over the years as well. So we, we haven't really, we've seen it, we've seen an increase on that increase overall. And where was that net increase in 2019? Um, kind of say, um, in terms of a number, I can't think of that right now. I know in, I know in 2019 for our reorg, we did 202 people for that reorg. And this year we did 346. So, so that's like a 68% increase if my Winthrop math is correct. Uh, so that is, I mean, that's, that's huge. Now, how many, how much money did you actually raise as far as fundraising in 2020 for the party? I know we, um, now 2020 was hard for fundraising. Um, 2019, we we're very fortunate. We had a big year where we did a, a big fundraiser, Senator Graham. Um, and we had about, I think we raised $12,000 off of like one event. Um, and typically when we only did a fundraise, we would do a fundraiser on even number of years. So that's when the excitement is, but we decided to do 2019, which was good. We were very thankful for because then 2020 is when COVID happened. And COVID was very challenging because how do you, how do you fundraise? How do you do a big event? And the reality is we couldn't. Um, so I kind of had to make more appeals to people just saying we, we, we've got a premium membership. So if you, you know, sign up for that, we'd appreciate it. And, and we had a fairly good war chest going into 2020. And that was because of the work we did in 2019 and also people being a little more generous in 2020. And what would that war chest be in 2022? Uh, so we're going to be setting ourselves up and, and I will not, you know, I've set up our budget for the rest of the, the year um, and it's very conservative. So in our off years, we like to be more fiscally conservative because we want to get, you know, higher profits, um, more revenue coming in. And then by 2022, you know, we have money to donate to candidates and to, you know, run an office if need be um, and other things like that. So odd years were really kind of getting tight fisted. And then 2022, you know, we build all that up and then can, unleash that. So I can't, can't give you an exact number. I know last time we had about um, $20,000 to play with um, but in 2020. Uh, so that was really good. We did a lot of stuff with the online um, marketing and then we donated to a lot of our candidates. Um, but that'll be up to the, you know, the next chair who will be elected on Saturday as to the exact, you know, what kind of fundraisers will they do and how do they go about raising that money. And how much money in total did you all donate to candidates in 2020? Um, I believe we, we decided we were going to split it half. So we did, we had $20,000. We had about, about $10,000 on online marketing. And I think we actually ended up doing more because with online, it kind of helps everybody. Um, and then 10,000, I think we did about 10,000 um, between all the different candidates. And we kind of have a formula for, you know, who gets this much, who's an incumbent and, you know, there's a power to incumbency. So who we're going to give more to, who's the new candidate, um, things like that. So it was about 10,000 for online and 10,000 for, uh, the candidates themselves. And what are the new candidates right now that you all are actually focused on? Uh, well, in 2020, we had, um, we had a new state senator. So um, Greg Gregory, right. who was a longtime senator from the Lancaster area, um, he retired. So we had a primary for that. So we had uh, Michael Johnson, who was our county councilman. He was our chair of our county council. He ran for that seat. And so we, we gave him a little bit more because uh, not that he will not any like Sanders candidates here, like, like saying that he wasn't a good candidate or not raising a lot of money, but he's a new person on the ballot. He, so we gave him a little bit more. We gave a little bit more to uh, the person then replacing him on county council. Um, and then we gave it, we gave to everybody um, state house, state Senate wise that was running uh, in York County. Now, how many candidates are you all recruiting this year? Well, for this year, uh, with this being an odd numbered year, right. uh, we, we won't uh, be too actively other. We'll, we'll see, you know, what's, well, I haven't talked to really any of our state reps about, you know, any intentions of retirements. Uh, I don't know of any, um, but, you know, once someone, if someone does announce that, then we'll, you know, be active, be active and see if we can recruit some folks. And, and really what's kind of challenging with the county party um, is you do not really play too much of a role in primaries. Um, so uh, when, when we had uh, Greg Gregory um, step down, we had um, four candidates, I believe, four candidates or so running for that seat. Two are from Lancaster and two are from York County because Senate 16 spreads across both those. Um, and we, we didn't support anybody. Um, it came off to runoff. We had two people from York County. We gave them opportunities to do um, um, events. We had a, a forum like this over Zoom with the two of them. And I helped moderate it with a professor from Winthrop. And we gave people the opportunity to learn. But then once we got our candidate, then we support that person 100%.
Now, what were those higher profits in 2019 for you all as far as fundraising? Uh, I'd have to look at the numbers exactly. Um, 2019 was our big fundraising year over the past because we kind of we operate off of two year cycles. Um, so I was first elected in 2017. Um, so you do two years and you have an next convention in 2019. Um, so of our two year of my two year term between 2019 and 2021, uh, our big fundraising year was 2019, um, which uh, our goal is to have two big years, 2019, 2020, huge war trust in 2020. But then, like I said, COVID happened. Uh, so that 2019 was that year we had the big Senate grand fundraiser that was coming off of just the Kavanaugh hearings where he had a huge boost in popularity. Um, it's kind of funny because, you know, if in 2017 I had a, a, a headliner of Senator Graham, I don't think it would have attracted as many people because he hasn't had the best relationship with some of our activists in the past because they, you know, some people aren't huge fans of Senator Graham. But then after the Kavanaugh stuff, all of a sudden, you know, we had like 300, uh, 350 people show up for our fundraiser. So that was, that was pretty great. So what is the biggest difference between 2019 and right now when you think of the York County Republican Party? Well, I think there's even more excitement. So I thought there was excitement in 2019. I mean, that's when we had our huge fundraiser, lots and lots of people. And now we've got even more people. And I think that's coming off of the, the national election, which, you know, our, our position nationwide, you know, with this, with, the, with Biden being president and um, the Congress being controlled by the Democrats, you know, it is not as much as we can do. Uh, but I mean, when we're thinking about the, the state Senate, the state house, we have more Republicans in there than ever before. So I think there's more opportunities in that regard. Um, and so we've got a lot of people that are frustrated about national stuff. And so we have to kind of, you know, focus them and say, listen, uh, we get what you're saying, but we also have to remember local and state stuff is important too, um, and, and get them involved in that as well. And you said this on your Facebook page, quote, I've got only, I've got one week left, obviously, this week as chair of the York County GOP. Pretty wild. I'll miss the company car and the six-figure pay. And of course, you mean, <laughs> yes. you mean sarcastic with that. But I think oh, above all else, I'll miss being known as the epitome of the establishment. What exactly is the epitome of the establishment <laughs> right now? Um, well, and that's kind of a joke. I've got, it's really not that many people that call me establishment. There's like one person, there's a couple people that like to call me like a rhino oh. or the establishment. I'm like, listen, do you know how much I get paid? And you know, <laughs> which is nothing. And like, you really think there's some like dark cabal where we meet in a, in a room and all that. Um, but they're, they're actually, what's really interesting. I'm sure you'll be doing some coverage of this also is the, the state chairman's race, right. Uh, for the SCGOP. Sure. And yeah, people that call that say like Drew McKissick, who I, who I know when I'm, I've endorsed, Right. Uh, that he's like the epitome of the establishment and he's awful and he's the worst thing that's ever happened. And I'm like, and you said, we're going to bring in Lynn Wood and have him really throw the table and, and cause chaos. And I'm like, this is, are you sure you guys know what you, you want to have the guy that lost us the Georgia Senate or the guy that said, Hey, uh, that we should, that Mike Pence should be shot as a traitor by a firing squad. You want that to be your chairman? Um, so um, establishment is a very relative term, you know, as, let's say somebody came through and said, you are establishment Tyler and I'm going to beat you. And let's say I was running again in 20 in, at the convention on Saturday and they beat me. Guess what they are now? They're the establishment. So it's, it's a, it's a very relative term. Just like Rhino is a relative term. As a matter of fact, let me go to the statement that former president of the United States, uh, Donald Trump said about his endorsement of Drew McKissick. He said this quote, Drew McKissick has done an outstanding job as South Carolina GOP chairman. Elected more than more Republicans in 2020 than in over 140 years. Drew fought all the way to the Supreme Court to defend our voting laws and won. He will continue to grow the party and help conservatives get elected in the great state of South Carolina. Drew has my complete and total endorsement for re-election. How can Drew grow the party and help conservatives get elected for the next five years? Well, if you're looking at what's happened, we've talked about York County, you know, for the past, you know, 10 minutes or so. He's going to, we have to do that statewide and if you've been um he's been doing a good job or the team's been doing a good job posting pictures of like the excitement across the state and we've seen county conventions and new york's that are just having unprecedented numbers so if we can find those people and plug them in, into our party i mean we're going to have bigger fundraising numbers uh, which means we can do more events and then 2024 you know we're going to have all these republicans coming to south carolina for the primary which we're going to capitalize on um and, and really we just need to find ways to plug people in um, get involved, and I mean, I think Drew's the guy for the job. Um, I, I can't, I can't, I can't speak highly of Drew enough. He does. He's 
He's done a fantastic job as, as state party chairman, and I've worked with him just as county party chairman since 2017, and also as his third vice chair this past term. Um, he, he is a great leader for the party, and I just think it would be an absolute disaster for, uh, for I don't think it was going to happen, but I, I, you know, yeah, I take every election seriously. And I'm going to be, I will no longer be county party chairman as of Saturday, and I'll be spending my time leading up to the state convention, you know, doing what I can to campaign for Drew and to make sure he uh, gets another term. Speaking of which, you said this quote, today I'm excited to announce my campaign for re-election as third vice chair of the South Carolina Republican Party. The next couple of years are going to be important for our party, and I believe it is important for young people to have a seat at the table. Who have been the stakeholders at the table? Uh, well, we, we've, um, well, you can, and this is with both parties, you know, it's relatively an older crowd. Um, and, you know, this is a problem in the Republican Party, um, both parties, but, you know, we, we've, when you, when you have one same group in there for a while, you know, it's hard for some, for young people to get, I mean, I'm an anomaly. I've, um, I've been the youngest county party chairman since I was elected in the state. When I was elected, I was 20 years old. Um, but after me, the next youngest chairman was in like, I think his mid twenties and then early thirties after that, it's more older folk. Um, and so I think there it's, it's important to bring more young people to the table, you know, bring our high school Republican kids, our college Republicans, our young Republicans, um, because, you know, one, one phrase that really annoys me is that, you know, young Republicans are the future of the party. And, and I, I say to that, no, we're the now of the party. You know, we want to get people in now. You want, we have young people who are elected officials. We have young people running campaigns. So we're not just delegate to the future. We need to be at the table now, uh, given perspective, because millennials and Gen Z all together actually make up a majority of the voting block now. They don't vote as frequently, um, but that's the majority of the voting block. So if we're going to be successful as a party, and not just 2022, 2024, 2024, but you're, like you're talking about five years plus down the future, we need these young people involved in the party now. How do you recruit and obviously, how do you recruit young adults that will reflect the value of the party? Uh, well, I think you need to talk about issues that matter uh, to young people. Um, you need to um, give them a voice um, and show them how to actively use that voice. Um, you know, I, I've been involved in, in every single level. We have three auxiliary groups in the, young, in the state party of young people. There's the Young Republicans, which is 18 to 40, College Republicans, which is, you know, college, and then teenage, which is high school. And, you know, kind of have, there's a different approach with each one. You know, some of them, it's providing inter internship opportunities. Others, it's uh, professional growth. If you're a young person and you want to, um, you know, learn more. Um, you know, with young people, I mean, this is a, a struggle that I've had. Um, I got, I've gotten married in the past couple of years. I've got a house. I've got all these things. And it's hard to like dedicate time where you're busy. You've got your developing your professional career to take time out of your life and away from your family and to be involved in this stuff. So we have to give a compelling reason and also make those events enticing for young people. What is your reason now? Uh, well, well, my reason is I want to. You know, I want to bring more young people. I feel like the party needs more young voices. We need uh, people that are coming from different perspectives to, to talk to members of the party. Um, we need to prepare ourselves for the long-term future. You know, I have a lot of people that, are, that believe that, you know, what matters most, like, which I have people said that, like, now that, uh, now that Joe Biden has won, we are on our way to becoming Venezuela and a socialist country and that America is basically done. And I'm like, I got like 60 years left in this country. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so I, I want people involved. I want more young people, um, people that are willing to stand up and, and be involved and to, to be that, you know, those voices of, uh, maybe a little bit more, more reason. And to also, you know, there's, there's sometimes a negative perception of young people. So I want that to be over. I want us to bring more people to the table because that, that's, that's better for everybody to me. And I'm asking two simplistic questions and it's probably redundant as well, but what that's will okay. be, what will be your eternal strategy and what will be your external strategy so internal i guess internal for me and then external everybody else or oh yeah for your, you as, for, as far as recruiting these candidates mm -hmm. what will be your eternal strategy what will be your external strategy um well i think you need to um it, it starts i saw i got a friend uh, i got into i'm on i'm on national committee man for the state of south carolina for young republicans so i've got to meet young republicans from across the state and a friend of mine from virginia made a really good observation that if you are running for office and you say hi i'm tyler griffin i'm running for state house district yada yada 
if you have to introduce yourself that way, then you're already behind, uh, or you probably shouldn't be running. Your your intention with running should not be for the sake of like beginning. Like that should be your first step. We need to get people involved in different levels of the community before they run for office. Um, so whether that's being involved in a local uh, Republican Party or a young Republican group, or it's um, some sort of community group where you're getting involved, or at, at a church, um, because you need to have more. Um, of a reason to be involved than just the sake of being a state house member or a state senate member. You know, um, I used to be, and some I used to be very embarrassed to say this, but I, um, you know, it's, it's open to talk about it. I when I was in my my twenties, when I was uh, tw when I was, well, I'm still in my twenties, so I was early twenties uh, when I first got involved. You know, I was saying to myself, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get involved in the county party. Then I'm going to run for state house. Then state senate. Uh, then I'll be governor. And then, you know, then the, you know, you have all these like big aspirations. And I, I stopped myself at one point and I was like, this is, that's really dumb. I said that the goal of public office is to be serving people. So, you know, unless I'm asked or unless the, the need calls for it, unless I really feel inclined, I shouldn't be running for state house or state senate. You should have an actual reason and be involved prior to the, than just saying like, huh, I should run for state senate. I would look really good in Columbia. Um, you need you need a reason. So with recruiting candidates, you know, we're looking for people that are involved in the community already or plugging people in to different um, areas, because um, I think that's just one of the most important things. You know, um, it, it'd be odd for someone to come in and just with no prior experience or no connection to the community to say I'm running for, for this. You know, it's, it's about more than just a title. It's about knowing the people and going to Columbia, serving your time, then eventually coming home. As third vice chair for the South Carolina GOP, where exactly would you expand the membership here in South Carolina? So my constituency for that position as third vice chair um, is um, you know, the young, the youngins, I like to call them. So like the from high school all the way to age 40. Um, and so as third vice chair, your, your biggest ally are those third, the, those, those three auxiliary groups I mentioned. Right. And so talking to them and finding ways that we can recruit uh, um, people. Um, whether it's providing those inter internship opportunities or making meetings a bit more different for young people than they are for like the standard meetings. So as county party chairman, you know, we have a meeting, you know, once a month and we go into like a hotel a kind of meeting room and we sit down in our rows and we have a speaker come in and they talk and, you know, it's kind of, it's engaging and it's good. Um, but for our young Republican meetings, maybe we'll meet um, at a park or we meet at um, a restaurant and we hang out and we, it's more social and it's, it can be net, like networking. And we may have a speaker, but it's going to be more of a casual setting where we can get together and talk about what matters to us and how, can, how we as young people can, can impact our communities and to be involved in politics. So, you know, th there's different strokes for different folks, I suppose. What are the unique challenges for your party? For the uh, so Republican Party as a whole? Yeah, for the South Carolina uh, GOP. Yes, sir? Well, I, I think... Um, in the macro sense, I think sometimes there's a, a negative stereotype of the Republican Party that, um, you know, it's, it's mainly um, older folks and mainly, um, mainly, I guess, older white folks is the, the common stereotype of what a Republican is. And I think part of that is bringing more voice. That's where that bringing more voices to the table thing. Is. So it, if I was um, and, and I like most members of my party are older, so I'm not saying this to disparage old people. But if I was like in my 50s or 60s and I said. Uh, hey, young person, get involved in the party. They might like raise an eyebrow and be like, why are you telling me to get involved? But it's different from coming from me, somebody who can relate to somebody uh, at a different level and make personal connections with them and make references to things. Um, that same thing is true of, you know, of, of minorities and of, of, of women, of having, of having uh, more voices. You know, it's, it's different talking about, you know, I, I think like the, the pro-life debate, I think, you know, everyone has a say in that, but it's, it's different to have a, a man talk about that than it is to talk, like have like a woman give their perspective or, um, you know, this is all sorts of things where I think it's, I don't want to get too much into identity politics, but I think the stereotype is that, you know, the Republican Party is all just one thing and that, um, you know, they don't, they don't understand perspective. So I think it's, um, we need to bring more people to the table and highlight some of our voices, which we do have different voices in the party. Um, besides older folks, um, and also listen to more people. Um, so um, I went to um, like back in back in uh, late May. Um, right. It was uh, late May, early June. We had when the George Floyd protests first started. I actually went to um, 
a, uh, an event in Rock Hill. It was a very large gathering of people. Um, and um, this was before some of the stuff in like the summer and, and really kind of like the, some of the stuff in D.C. was prior to all that. It was a very good event, very peaceful. Um, and I listened and I reflected on it. And I think we need to listen to people and come up with, with our own solutions for issues and show that we're listening for, with different things. But what is your perspective for the pro-life debate? What should you be listening to and what solutions should they come up with? In terms of who should the, who should the, um, the state, like leaders in Columbia be, be listening to? Um, well, I mean, there, there's a lot of voices in this debate. You know, there's, um, you know, I, th- I think we start this conversation talking about the different, um, different sides, you know, to different debates and I, how we tend to like um, polarize and demonize the other side. And I think with, with listening to this debate, um, we need to listen to, you know, there's even, even the names of the movements are designed to show that one is more positive than the other. So pro-life, you know, no one wants to be on the side saying they're anti-life, um, pro-choice. No one wants to necessarily be anti-choice. So, um, you know, I think we need to be listening to, to both camps in the argument. Um, and, you know, finding if, if there is a, a middle ground, I've, I've looked at polling data and it seems like for the most part, America, like Americans are not, and I, I, I got to find the data um, to show you this at some point, um, just to, to back this up. But um, from, from my understanding, like Americans are not for, you know, super, super late term abortions, but they're also, um, you know, when it comes to the right for an abortion, they um, are not to the extreme that some in, in my party are. So where is it? You know, there is a middle ground. Um, so where can we find that? Um, and, and, you know, what does it mean to be pro-life? Because there, there are people in the Republican Party that, for them, it is, there's different increments of, like, what does it truly mean to be pro-life? Is it okay to have, so I believe with the heartbeat bill that was passed, that's usually about six weeks. You know, there's some people that would, that would say, even upon conception, that is not allowed. So where do we, in our own party, do we settle that debate? Or, or can we settle that debate? And what are those other increments that you foresee? Uh, in terms of the, um, what well, I have to see, I, I think there's going to be, um, right now we're seeing um, some challenges from the federal level. Right. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Um, and I think it's going to, um, with the way that the court was reshaped um, under the, the Trump administration, you know, we'll see how that, that goes with the, um, the pro-life debate, um, whether that will be allowed, the heartbeat bill. And I, I know the governor has made clear that he's, um, and the attorney generals make clear that they're going to to take that up as as high up as it needs to go. Um, so I, I'm not sure. You know, I need to we'll we'll see how that develops. And I think what what happens with the heartbeat bill will kind of be a uh, not only a precedent for South Carolina, but it could if it were to go to the Supreme Court at any point, um, be a, a nationwide thing. We'll we'll just have to see with that. And let me get back to over to you as far as your uh, reelection for the uh, for, for the third vice chair for SCGOP. How exactly do you retain the party's loyalty? Uh, well, you, you work hard and you show that you are working hard. Uh, I'm actually going to be meeting um, tomorrow with my, uh, I've got an opponent for that position, a um, uh, young woman named uh, Lane Smith who helped out with SC1. We we're actually going to meet for lunch uh, tomorrow and uh, talk with one another about a couple of different things and see where we align on, on certain issues. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I'm. Um, you know, I, I'm one who I've, I've done. I've done a term, and even though I've announced my reelection, um, Layton is a is a is a great candidate. And you know, if we if we have a discussion and realize that hey, you know, if we're on the same page, maybe we can work something. You know, we'll see how that goes. Um, but I'm not I'm not one who is a title chaser. You know, if there if there are other people that that could be um, empowered by running for the position, and I could focus on more of a smaller scale thing, um, we'll say like the young Republicans, I'd be happy to do that also. So. We shall see how that conversation goes. And where exactly do you align with those issues with her? Uh, well, she she is a um, uh, she worked very hard for SC for the SC one uh, right. campaign with um, with Nancy Mace, right? And um, uh, so she is. Um, and we're talking strictly when it comes to recruiting young people. She did a lot when it came to getting a lot of interns for for the um, for the party. So, is there a way that we can retain those interns and like keep them in the party? long-term and get them involved in different levels. Um, so I, I applaud her work with that. 
And, you know, for a position like this, I don't think there's going to be a lot of areas of disagreement. You know, if her and I could work together rather than, you know, going through um, any sort of like, um, you know, contentious thing, which even, even if we both, you know, end up running, uh, you know, it, it won't be contentious. I mean, you know, she wins, I win. We're, we're you know, both going to be happy, both working with, uh, with each other regardless. Um, like I said, I'm not, I'm not someone that's like going to cling to a title. I've done it. I, I've, I won by acclamation in 2019. Uh, so I was like unanimous. And so if I talk to her and she seems like she, she'd do a good job. And if I can spend my time elsewhere and also spend some more time with my family, uh, you know, if she's, if she seems like the person I'd be like, okay, sounds good. Tyler Griffin. Thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome to the award winning Quentin's close ups. Yes, this was great. I, I am. I'm, this was on my bucket list uh, uh, to, uh, <laughs> to be interviewed. Uh, by you. I was even going to take a screenshot real quick <laughs> just, to, just to commemorate the moment. Thank you. Uh, so let me see. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this was great. Um, so uh, so this was your, so you had your 2000th interview the other day then? Yeah, Thursday and today is 2002. Wow. 